Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 97 of the podcast. It's the 8th of November, 2017, as I record this intro. My guest this week is Erica Davis Petrie. Erica speaks regularly at unschooling conferences across the U.S., sharing her passion for unschooling through the lenses of joy, teens, and diversity. This week, we focus our conversation on unschooling and diversity, and she has some wonderful insights to share. She speaks so eloquently about the value of doing the work to move through our fears around the topics of racism and diversity, as well as sharing her thoughts about ways to encourage diversity in our day-to-day unschooling lives and tips on ways to approach challenging conversations around racism with extended family members. I really enjoyed our conversation and I'm excited to share it with you guys. As a personal update this week, I've been enjoying getting back into the swing of things here cleaning up in the yard in preparation for winter. I've been reading some unschooling stuff, some business stuff, and some great fiction. I'm in the middle of the Broken Earth trilogy. It's cold enough now that Rocco's starting a fire in the wood stove most days, and the clocks move back on the weekend here. So just embracing fall's beautiful transition, really. I love this season. And I want to take a moment to send a huge thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. And a big welcome to new patron, Jessica Shear. You guys inspire me to keep exploring the fascinating world of unschooling. And I really appreciate your support in sharing unschooling information with anyone who's curious to learn more about this wonderful lifestyle. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week's quote is from Erica. I really would hope that, especially in the unschooling community, diversity is achieved by moving out of your comfort zone, your area, your neighborhood, and moving into someone else's culture, comfort zone, neighborhood, for all kinds of art classes, library things, swimming things, opportunities for all kinds of cultural and community experiences. I wanted to pull that out from our conversation just to emphasize it. And as we dove into that idea, Erica made another great point. If you look at it as an obligation, as something you, quote, have to do for your children to have diverse experiences, you are going to resent it after a while. Instead, look at it as giving your children more of life and the richness of the experience will win out. With unschooling, we encourage our children's engagement with the world. It's our choice, not an obligation. And both us and our children will be richer for the experience. Now, that doesn't mean forcing those experiences on our children. It means casting a wider, more interesting and diverse net in our lives as they unfold. And now, on to my conversation with Erica. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and today I'm here with Erica Davis Petrie. Hi, Erica. Hi, Pam. Hello. To anyone who hasn't come across Erica yet, just a short intro. Erica and her husband, Michael, have four now adult children. They have unschooled for many years and loved it. Erica continues to speak at unschooling conferences all over the U.S., her favorite topics being unschooling teens, the joy of unschooling, and celebrating diversity through unschooling. She's also an ATC fanatic, which are artist trading cards, and if you haven't heard of them, maybe do a quick online search and see if it's something that you or your children might like to play with, because I know we really had a lot of fun with them for a few years when the kids were younger. And to get us started, Erica, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? Where to start? Um, 
<laughs> um, we um, have recently moved back to the west coast of the United States. We live in San Francisco after living uh, quite a few years in uh, Connecticut. Um, all of my children, who are adults now, um, also live on the west coast, so it's good. No more cross-country jaunts to uh-huh. visit. Huh. We have um, one daughter and three sons and uh, two son-in-laws, a daughter-in-law, an almost daughter-in-law, <laughs> and two <grandparents. laughs> Um The last two of my children were unschooled. The last, the youngest of my children was unschooled his entire uh, school age career, with the exception of second grade. If your child wants to go to school as an unschooler, I highly recommend second grade. It's <laughs> It's a, good, it's a good experience still. Um, you get a real taste of, of schooling, and um, it's not so soul-crushing that you have to do a lot of repair later. So um, I don't know if there's anything else. I've been with my husband uh, for more than half my life, um, and we are enjoying uh, this phase of our lives, just being grandparents and having our kids spread their wings and be doing all kinds of different things. So that's, yeah. that's, that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you go back then um, and share with us a bit about what your family's move to unschooling looked like? Sure. Oh, my oldest three children are quite a bit older than my youngest. Um, my oldest and youngest are about 14 years apart. So um, when she entered the school, my only my only daughter entered school. Um, it was completely a different experience from when my son would have entered um, kindergarten. So we started thinking, God, there's got to be another way. We didn't know anything about unschooling. We were just going to homeschool, quote unquote. Um, but homeschool without a curriculum and with just fun and playing and and learning and being, just being. When we moved to Connecticut, my um, second youngest was uh, 14, I want to say. Had just turned 14. And um, we, he wanted to, to experience learning without boundaries, borders. Um, so for the first year we were in Connecticut, he unschooled, had a great time, and but was a athlete. And in Connecticut, you cannot participate in um, high school sports without being a high schooler. They exclude homeschoolers from sports. So he decided, I'm going to go to school because I want to participate in track and field and other sports. And, and that was when my youngest said, I want to go to school too because, you know, older brother's going. Mm-hmm. So we had, we had three three sons in uh, in the public schools in Connecticut and it was an eye opener on how much things had changed and how much different schools were than the um, democratic free school that my older children had gone to and so I said that's it I'm I'm out <laughs> I, I don't have the patience I once had um, <laughs> rally the troops and, and to be progressive for everybody else I was just looking at the tender soul that I was in charge of. And the last couple of years had been really good for him. And uh, I saw a lot of change in personality. I saw a lot of change in in, um, how he wanted to be. And I just said, no, we'll go back to doing what we were doing. It was successful. And we're partners. And both of the partners have to be relatively happy with what they're doing. And I was not. And he was, he was okay, but not great. And we had been great. So we returned to greatness. So that's how we got to be unschooled. So my two oldest always went to school. Um, the third one, we call him our bi-schooler <laughs> because <laughs> went to school, was unschooled, and then went to traditional high school and college. And then the youngest uh, only went to second grade for a full year of school and has never looked back. 
he is not college educated, just working and writing and living his life. And he's, I, I would say from the outside looking in, very happy with his choices at this point. That's so that's awesome. how we came. That's how we came to unschool. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. Such a wide range of experiences. And, you know, in the end, you're, you were basically looking to your relationships, right? That kind of helped guide you as to what was going right. to work out well for each one of them, right? Right, right. I, I often have asked if I would have unschooled my older children um, if given the opportunity. And my answer to that is uh, yes and no. Yes, because of the opportunity to afford it the youngers, but no, because I really like who they are now and they would have been different had they been unschooled. And I really like who they are now. So the situation presented itself for the younger and it didn't for the older. And I, I'm more leaning toward um, it was the right choice for them because it was the situation that we had mm-hmm. um, every younger. So circumstances changed, the relationships changed, the need changed. And I just went with it. Oh, I think that's that's such a great point. You know, I, second guessing ourselves doesn't doesn't help, does it <laughs> at all? <laughs> and it only induces, you know, your it, it only makes it harder to move forward in your yeah, life. Yeah, exactly. I I, yeah. I I spend too much time looking, second guessing what's coming. To, 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 <laughs> <laughs> pursuits on my opinion in my opinion mm-hmm. <laughs> now earlier this year i heard you speak at an unschooling conference about unschooling and diversity and i really enjoyed your talk you shared some very enlightening stories about the subtle impact of privilege in our society and i was hoping you could share one with us here well sure um for all the years i've been speaking at unschooling conferences the focus has been on increasing diversity amongst unschoolers, but really um, in society at large, making sure that we are able to have conversations with people from diverse backgrounds and aren't shocked when we encounter them, especially in uh, unschooling communities, homeschooling communities where you you self-select who you spend your time with. If you don't like someone or they rub you the wrong way, as an unschooler or homeschooler, you can just stop seeing them. You could just move away. And that works. Um, I, I'll correct myself. It doesn't work. It, it, it just it puts a bandage on a, a larger problem, which is uh, how do I get along with someone that um, comes at situations in a different way than I do, um, is annoying, or is it's not satisfactory? How do I develop the skill to encourage them to see things from a different perspective? It's one of the little um, little things that's missing when you live in a homogeneous um, community and you don't have to deal with a lot of diversity if you choose not to. Um, and so I would talk about how to encourage um, being out of, the, out of your comfort zone, being out of your box. And for many years, that worked really well for me. The last few years, especially with the political uh, environment that came about with um, the election of Barack Obama and and the subsequent election of our current administration, uh, I realized that just encouraging diversity was not enough. And so I started talking really directly about race and racism and how can we um, have these difficult conversations, particularly um, in all white Black, Hispanic, when your when your community is by and large homogeneous, how do we have these conversations when we're seemingly unaffected by um, the results of racism? Um, how do we encourage our kids to have these kinds of conversations and see how privilege uh, plays a huge role in how people are treated in our country? so that we are um, more inclined to participate in equity rather than um, to want or wish for a colorblind society. 
society. I've seen a lot of uh, well-meaning folk talk about why well, I don't see color. And that in and of itself, I think is one of the most racist statements <laughs> of all. Because mm-hmm. If you don't see that I'm um, African-American, black, um, you're missing 90% of who I am. Mm-hmm. And why would you want to miss that? Um, so that's, that's the sheer sign that you need to do some work. If you don't want to see my color, um, ask yourself why that is, because that that's where the bias lives. But there shouldn't be any problem with you seeing that I'm black. There shouldn't be a problem. And if there is, if you feel that the colorblind answer is correct one, ask yourself why that is. Because that's the... Yeah, I thought that was such a great, great point when you were talking about that. And that leads nicely into our next question. Because as we move to unschooling, we learn the value of digging into our own fears and questioning that conventional wisdom, right? Um, In many areas of our lives, like you're talking about not seeing color. For example, our for unschooling, one of the thing, first things we uh, dig into is our fears around learning, right? That our children won't learn if we don't tell them what they need to know or if we don't insist that they follow a certain timetable. And through that process, we eventually discover that we truly can trust them to learn, that they're born to learn. And, and after that, our world opens up and we see so much more that was there. And it was always there, but we could never see it because we were so blinded by our fears. So I was hoping you could talk a bit about whether we can apply the same kind of process to our fears surrounding race and diversity. Oh, absolutely. But the, the, the key difference, I see, is discern. Um, mm-hmm. we're, we're constantly, when we deal with race, asking people to suspend discernment as if that will solve the problem, not recognizing difference, not recognizing that um, brown people, um, people of color experience our culture differently. Um, When we ask, especially young people, to not discern, we're telling them there's something wrong with that discernment. Mm -hmm. Um, So we need to, to shy away from the colorblind theory that don't discern, everybody's the same, and actually move into their difference makes them richer. They add to my life, not take from it, not to be ashamed to notice, but actually to notice and celebrate it. So it it is like the move towards unschooling, recognizing that things are learned without being taught. Um, Mm -hmm. That's all the inherent biases that we have going forward are from learned behavior. Um, no one's born a racist. No one's born biased. They learn them by gentle ways. Not we. We sometimes get wrapped up in the big R racism. You know, the Klan and the mobs and the N word and and people making direct threats to people of color mm-hmm. to tell them they don't to tell them they're not a part of that. That big R racism. It's pretty easy to pick a side. It's the little r racism that we've got to tackle. It's the slight, it's the assumptions made based on skin color, based on culture that we need to eradicate. And the only way to do that is to talk about how it looks to you. How does that brown person look to you? What is your first gut instinct when you see someone of color in certain situations? Because that's where the bias lives. If you make the assumption of criminality, if you make the assumption of better than, if you make the assumption of worse than or less than, that's where you need to start your excavation. We all live in North America. We all live in a very racist, biased culture. We all swim in that suit. And the only way to eradicate it is everybody recognizing that it's structural. It's not even personal first. It's structural. We, we all make assumptions based on the structure of inequity. And in order to break it down, we have to see our part of it and our benefits of it. Mm-hmm. Because even if you have marginal benefits, if 
certain aspects of me are highlighted and celebrated, but then other aspects are denigrated and you're made to feel ashamed. So we, we have to un, unpack our, our racist knapsacks that we're all given living in this culture. We have to unpack it. And the default is racist. It's not not racist. <laughs> the default is racist. The default is bias. The default is privilege. It's not neutral. When you don't do anything, it's it's not a neutral thing. It, you default to the the bias, racist structure that this this country and this continent was founded on. You can't get away from it by just I don't see color and I I see everyone equal. No, you have to unpack this act. Yeah, I mean, and it it seems to, you know, what came to mind when you were talking was was also because we work through with unschooling um, all the biases against children, right? And we can we start to see the 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 structural nature of it, you know, just the conventional wisdom, but it even goes beyond that because it's built right into society as well, isn't it? So and. and and to and to be open enough with yourself to ask yourself those questions and to um, acknowledge um, the fears and and the innate um, actions and reactions that we have and to acknowledge those and take the time to work through them. Um, that's Correct. where it's important, right? Yeah, but it's very painful because yeah. admitting that you're, that you're racist or that you're biased. Um, it, it, it doesn't feel good. And mm-hmm. we are taught, even in our constitution, we're, we're pursuing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we, we, we've been given the charge to be happy, to be um, comfortable, to be celebrated. And this does the exact opposite. It doesn't feel comfortable. We're not being celebrated. We're being asked to take apart for, for many, many people. We're being asked to take apart and to give up a piece of what is seemingly American, what's seemingly Canadian, what's seemingly Mexican, what seemingly we are given by virtue of being a part of this great society. You're asking uh, a great deal of the population to set that aside and look for something else. And that that's uncomfortable. And that it doesn't feel good. And it feels like a loss. If, if someone gains something, um, we've been taught, then someone loses. We have not been taught in our society that there can be a win-win. We talk about win-win, but we really don't believe in it. We believe if we if someone gains something, we're going to lose something. So that's the first structural aspect of this that we have to dismantle is, is the win-lose. We've got to look for win-win because when we're all lifted up and we're all comfortable, we all do better. But convincing someone who has that privilege to share is it's it's one of the most challenging things. It's very much like um, us trying to make others understand that children are whole, complete beings. They they don't need to grow into something. They mm-hmm. they deserve their wholeness just by being um, people that traditionally parent, that traditionally see children as left, they, they think they're giving something up by giving children their autonomy and giving them their partnership in, in their own existence. They feel like something's going to give up. I mean, many, many unschoolers, myself included, have had talks with grandparents, letting them know, no, you're not, you're not losing anything by respecting his autonomy, by allowing him to speak for himself. By allowing him to have his feelings and emotions not stifled or stymied because he's younger. Um, and convincing them that they're not losing anything. As a matter of fact, they're gaining something in having someone who's treated respectfully because that person, nine times out of ten, is going to be a very respectful person to others. But if it's been ingrained in you, the only way to get this kind of person is this kind of process. Breaking mm-hmm. down that process is difficult. It's very yeah. difficult. I know, and that is such a such a great point, um, and and it's it's that deep, isn't it? Right, it's that ingrained in us, and it's it can be such a huge. It's a, that's a big and powerful shift. 
Oh yeah, and it's very comfortable being um, the wise and all all powerful Oz. It's very reassuring when you finally get to the point where you're the person that is respected, that is looked upon greatly. Um, I, I kind of um, I use as an analogy the the uh, fraternity sorority system and the hazing. Everyone always asks, well. Why is there hazing? Why does why does someone who was so badly treated treat others badly? And it, it's because they were badly treated. It mm-hmm. it's it, it always is possible to regenerate, to redo what was done to you. The hardest thing is saying no. I know that was done to me, but it wasn't right. I may have survived it and come out of it okay, but it wasn't right. We need to change it. it. That's a very difficult thing to do, particularly if you get benefits from a structure of pain. And we as a society um, benefit greatly as we age, and then it falls off because then we're elderly and then they treat us like crap. But we benefit so greatly in those middle years that it's kind of hard to break that cycle of deprivation and pain and hurt and saying no one has to go through that to get to the good stuff. It's really, really difficult. But, you know, the reward is we have a much more equitable and and a much more happy and content society. But getting there, oh, that's tough. That's tough because you're going you're gonna to have to give up something. Yeah, and I love you talked about earlier. <laughs> it's a richer society, right? I mean, we're richer, deeper, wider. I mean, it just... Yeah, I think I like that word. <laughs> yeah. Um, so speaking of, I was hoping you could share some ways that you had talked about before as well, um, in which we can be more welcoming to families from the wide variety of backgrounds that do exist in the unschooling community. Well, there's two things that I, I almost always say at conferences, um, and I almost always say it first. Um, there, there is plenty right you can do uh, to develop um, diverse um, friendships and diverse um, activities, but there's two or three things that you can absolutely um, fall on the sword. Number one, if you don't live in a diverse community, if you don't have diverse, rich experiences, please don't make your only diverse experience charitable. So, Mm -hmm. Don't go to the food kitchen on Thanksgiving. Don't help out at the homeless shelter. Don't don't deal with diversity in a charitable way. Uh, we are helping. The helping, um, the good helper um, syndrome is really difficult to get beyond once you reach a level of maturity. And that um, less than attitude um, from well-meaning people is in my opinion, just as bad as the person that says, you're brown, I don't want you around. Um, you're, you're, you're trouble because of your culture. I really would hope that, um, especially in the unschooled community, diversity is achieved by moving out of your comfort zone, your area, your neighborhood, and moving into someone else's culture, comfort zone, neighborhood, or all kinds of art classes, uh, library things, swimming things, opportunities for, uh, you know, all kinds of um, cultural and community experiences. You can just leave your neighborhood and experience a writing class on the other side of town, a book club on the other side of town. If your actual town is not very diverse, there are plenty of ways to be welcoming, and that's by extending yourself and your discomfort level in into another community and meeting friends that way. I think it's it's one of the best ways we as unschoolers have to, um, you know, broadening our palate and making sure that we have diverse experiences. Yeah, I loved that point because um, 
first of all, the yeah, the impression that you're leaving with your children, like without saying anything, if your only focus is on charity, I thought that was such a great point. I'd never thought of it that way. And uh, that was very cool when you shared that. And the idea is to, to uh, extend your community, right? Go different places. Um, you don't have to stay. I think, you know, and that, that reminds me of when, you know, people talk about trying an activity, right? Um, you know, whether it's karate or girl guides or whatever, they always pick the closest one just for convenience, right? right. But think think bigger. Like I know um, with my kids, I've driven distances for um, many reasons, you know, girl guides an hour away because that group was a, a better fit. And, you know, this is yet another reason why we don't need to um, keep our mindset so close geographically, right? There's so many great reasons to open ourselves up to all the possibilities that, you know, maybe an hour or two, like we've gone two hours away to things on a regular basis. You know, it's a great reason for that. Exactly. You have to look at it as a friendship. And if mm -hmm. you look at it as a friendship and rather, rather than an obligation, it's pretty easy to widen your power. If you look at it as an obligation, I have an obligation to have my children have diverse experiences. Yeah. You're going to resent it after a while. But if you look at it as a friendship, as giving your children more, as equipping them with more rather than less, um, the richness of the experience will, will win out. Um, but we are creatures of convenience. And we mm -hmm. do like being around each other. When I say that, we like being around people that we know, people that make us feel comfortable, people that we can be unconscious around. It's, it's, it's a powerful myth that um, it's easy to be in a diverse community. It is not. It's, it's constantly questioning what you know to be true. So it's work. It's work to be in a diverse community. It's easier to be in a homogeneous community where you think everyone feels the way you do. You have social norms that you conform to. That's easier. It is easier. Um, it's more difficult to think of someone that you have seemingly nothing in common with. Um, how are they going to react to this? How are they going to feel about that? It, it takes a lot of emotional work to, to put yourself out there. It's, it's not easier. It gets easier, but it's not easy. We self-segregate because it's easy for economic reasons, for racial re and cultural reasons, for um, gender reasons. We self-segregate quite nicely as humans. And not doing that is, is difficult at first. It gets easier, but it still it butts up against what we feel is normal, quote unquote. Just like unschooling. It, it, mm -hmm. it gets easier. I mean, the first few years I was unschooling, I didn't know what it was called. And the, the need to have that workbook, you know, on the counter and have it available on the bookshelf, have it available in the, in the, in the um, book bin, have it available in the trunk, have it available in the box, the garage. You, you see how it's moving? You see how it's moving? <laughs> but it's still available because if that's the way I want availability, that's that's kind of, that's, to me, that's the representative of, of how we handle anything that's against our norm. We, we leave the option for normalcy available. Um, and we, as we move towards something else, we, we leave the option available. And I wish and hope that we can do the same thing with diversity. We, we try on new things. We reject what doesn't feed our soul. And we take on what does and constantly encouraging ourselves, well, if that wasn't the right way to do it, there's other ways. And if this isn't the right way to do it, there's other ways. And continuing to do the work. The hardest part is doing the work. The easiest thing is to leave that workbook on the kitchen table because it reassures you. It's hard for your kids, but it's easier for you. Um, it, it gets easier again when you move it to the bookshelf because it's easier for your partner, your child. Um, and it shows that it doesn't have to be front and center. And then it's far easier when it moves to the, to the trunk 
to the to the book bin. And it's far easier when it moves to the box in the garage. And I'll tell you, it's far easier when it ends up at the Goodwill as a donation for someone else that needs that because you don't need it anymore. But those steps, those phases, they may take years, they may take months, they may take weeks, they may take days, depending on the process and where you are in it. We, we have got to encourage um, diversity and diverse thought in the exact same way. Let people lead people to walking that walk themselves, helping them see that the walk is valuable, helping them see that we all benefit when we see diversity as a plus, not as a, a chore. Yeah, and I, and I love that image of moving the book further out because that's something that I find myself talking about quite a bit in Unschooling Conversations is our comfort zones and the work to stretch our comfort zones. You know, often we talk about it with our children and their interests. And, you know, I've said every single time I have done the work to stretch my comfort zone, I have benefited from it every single time. And, you know, to me, this is just just another uh, area of comfort zones that, yes, as you said, you know, it's a lot of work and it can take time, but the richness and the benefits for everyone at the end of it. Well, you know what? There's not an end. There's always, you know, more, but extending in extending your comfort zone, right? Sure. And the hard part about about um, about increasing diversity is there's the expectation that there will be an end. I yeah. mean, when we elected Barack Obama, um, the, the, the talk of post-racial began almost immediately. Oh, we've, we've gotten to the point where, you know, this black guy can be president. And it's like, that's not an end. That's the beginning. As a matter of mm-hmm. fact, I, I submit to you that um, his being elected um, brought all the, the horror of America out in the, to the open for the first time in 40, 50 years. We've been very complacent in thinking that we've done our work and here's the black guy who's a result of our work. We're so much better than we were 40 or 50 years ago, and he's the proof. And in actuality, um, he exposed that our work was far from done. We, we had made strides, but our work was far from done. And that the folks that really felt his inferiority, they came out of the woodwork. And it wasn't just it wasn't just the rednecks poor people. It was it was proper society. It was it was the educated. It was it was the people that we had expected because of their of their um, financial superiority to a lot of other people. We thought, oh, well, those people those people have nothing to fear from from this black man, and they proved no, no, no. It, it's not him that we fear. It's losing our supremacy, losing our benefit of being always looked to, to being in charge, always looked to, to setting the norm, always looked to, to, to leading. Um, and this, quite frankly, challenged that assertion. And so I look at where we are as a society right now, and we're at one of those pinnacle moments where we get to choose which way we're going to go. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't look like we're making good choices for a vast majority of the people who um, live in our society. We're, we're, we're making the choice that is recognizable, that is comfortable, that um, doesn't take work. We're, we're choosing, I, I want it to be the, the good old day never existed it was the bad old days very 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 many people um the comfort the comfort of knowing is is being upheld over the the comfort of progress that's a great point and when we're looking at 
the discomfort, you know, of progress. I was wondering if you could share some tips on approaching these kinds of challenging conversations uh, around diversity with extended family members. Well, I always say, and um, boy, more people have sent me private <laughs> messages. <but> thank, you. <laughs> thank you for saying that. You know, if you come upon a racist relative, because the holiday season is coming up, yeah. and there's always one, there's always somebody that says something, especially in the United States with the controversy of the taking a knee um, mm-hmm. during the book. Um, ask a question. Don't make a statement. Um, so, you know, cousin Sarah says they should be grateful. I can't believe they're doing that. You know, they're highly paid and and they should, they should honor the flag for all of the people who died so that they can freely make millions on the field. Instead of saying, I can't believe you said that. uh, Why would you say something like that in an accusatory way? Say, how did you come to believe that? Because I think different. If you, did. how did you come to how did you come to that conclusion? Because I saw the same thing and I came to a different conclusion. I want to walk you. I want you to walk me through how you came to that. Um, when someone makes a racist joke around you, and normally you would just stay silent, be angry, but just stay silent because you didn't want to be that one, be that person. Mm-hmm. That makes everyone else uncomfortable, ask yourself why you would want to be comfortable with that discomfort. Start asking questions rather than making statements. Stop declaring yourself other and declare them included, included in your life in a valuable way, so much so that you want them to be better instead of leaving them as is. The hardest part I I see is, is challenging um, the comfortable is challenging the, the uncle who is your favorite and challenging the cousin who, or sister or mother or father who um, always gave you comfort and always was put on a pedestal. See that that pedestal um, needs to be redefined and it needs you need them to live up to the ideals that you have. So ask questions. Ask Ask, 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 ask questions. I say ask a couple of questions before you make a statement. So ask, why, why would you feel that way? And if they, if they don't answer you or they deflect, ask again in another way. I, I understand that you think that, but what I want to know is why? How did you come to that? And then if they don't answer you, say, I, I can't put up with this. This isn't something I can tolerate because it's so against my beliefs. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get up and walk away because I, I can't. Don't just walk away. If you're walking away, say why. Um, this is so inappropriate. I'm so disappointed. I'm walking away. And make it personal. Make I statements, not we statements. Make I statements. Own your disgust. If they said something disgusting, own it, and then walk away. If that's all you do, you plant a seed. People are thinking. Because I guarantee you, unless you're totally in a completely racist family, three other people who are sitting there want to say and do what you did, and you're encouraging them, if for no other reason to think. And if there are young people at the table, you're telling them what you've done by your actions. So it's really important, very important, to ask questions and then make statements with action. If the statement is made without action, it's just words. But if someone says something that's sufferable or intolerable, let them know it has no place with you and and leave. But always make the statement. Don't just walk away. Always make the statement because people are learning all the time. Yeah, and you know, if you walk away without saying without the statement, as you said, so often they won't even, you know, realize you aren't planting that seed, right? <laughs> I think that that seed planting is is a great point because um, that's, you know, 
I mean, I do the same thing even with, with anybody out and about when the conversation even about unschooling or whatever, something that is so unconventional that makes other people uncomfortable to be able to plant that seed um, so that they can talk because, you know, confrontation, um, when it escalates, uh, n- there's not a lot of learning there, right? Um, but when they have that seed so that they can take that with them, it's planted um, for them to think about and process as they go through their days. That's where learning really happens. And there are times when confrontation is appropriate. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I'm not saying walk away, plant a seed when something is wholly inappropriate. Um, there are times, and you know when those times exist. And everyone yeah. likes to be like, oh, I, I want to know when that, yeah, you know. You know <laughs> when the time presents itself when you're supposed to speak up. Um, mm-hmm. If you're comfortable with someone being maligned, with someone being treated less than, that comfort is your lesson. That yeah. that's, the, that's the lesson you're teaching with your actions. You know when it's time to say, oh, no, you're not going to say that in front of me and get away with it. I don't care who it is. Uh, We have to be courageous in discomforting the comfort. And nine times out of ten, the discomfort is felt by you. It's so easy to not confront, to not speak up, to walk away, oh, I felt so bad, and to write a Facebook post or to send out, mm-hmm. uh, I'm so sorry, I wasn't able to say anything. It, it, it's far too easy to do that. And if you're doing that on a regular basis or you find yourself um, making excuses for inaction, that's where the work lies. Don't, don't, don't worry about cousin so-and-so or uncle such-and-such. Start the work with you. Why am I comfortable saying nothing? Why am I comfortable maintaining that kind of rancor. Why? What do I fear will happen? And if the fear is isolation, if the fear is not belonging, if the fear is your wildest dreams, disinheritance, whatever, if that is your fear, it's more about you than the person who's spouting the crap. It's more about you. It's not about them. Do your work Mm -hmm. first. Be that example to yourself. Yeah, I mean, and that ties right back to what we were talking about at the beginning, about how much of this is our work processing yeah. our fears, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it applies to many, many things. It applies to many, many relationships. The, uh, the wary thing about, about isms is it, it just never ends. Once your eyes open to an ism in this area, your eyes open to an ism in that area, you're, you're constantly excavating our culture, our societies, isms. You know, mm-hmm. from the time you're you're aware until the time you die, you're you're constantly unpacking the luggage of ism because comfort is the most addicting feeling. We want to be comfortable and seen as nice and and to live a nice, comfortable existence. And so that drug of comfort, uh, it's so powerful especially when you're in a homogeneous group. What makes us, the universal us, comfortable? Well, not having to think about that, not having to see that, not having to deal with that. If it's not my issue, being able to avoid that. I, I don't want to see that. I don't want to, I don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation with my son when he, when he happens upon a YouTube video of a man being shot in the back. I, 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 don't, want to, I don't want to see the protest and, and be asked, What's that all about? And not be able to have a have a comprehensive act answer that makes me look good, that makes me look progressive, that makes me look aware, that makes me look like I'm a participant in justice when actually I'm not doing anything at all but avoiding those tough conversations. It's all about comfort, and our whole lives are spent comfortable. And then you're asking me to be to be the um, person who brings discomfort into my house. I don't think so. I don't I don't think I'm gonna do that. Um, unless I'm pushed up against the wall. I'm saying the wall is there. It's on top of us. Uh, particularly uh, when it comes to race. 
the, the wall is on us. And I, I, the one thing I correct whenever I see it online or at conferences is the myth of the youth are so much more progressive. They're so much more positive. They see race so differently. No, every old racist was young. And mm-hmm. every young racist has a family that cares about them, has a, a, a community that cares about them, and has nurtured those thoughts, those ideals. We need to stop with the structure of it's only old people, it's only jaded people, it's only poor people, it's only rich people, it's only, 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 only. It's us. It's every last one of us. Every person has the potential to be biased, to be angry, to be ugly. Everyone does. And we have to get over the good people syndrome because it, it doesn't exist. Give, given a set, set of circumstances, people can do amazingly cool and amazingly welcoming beautiful things. The cruel versus the welcoming beautiful, it's all up to us. Every moment, every every chance we get, we need to recognize we're making choices based on what we came up with, what was acceptable in our society, what was acceptable in our culture. Anytime I hear it's it's old people, I say Charlottesville was full of college students in khaki. It was not old. And by your argument, they are the most privileged and they should be the most content and they aren't. Why is that? Because that's the root. That's where we have to start working. Otherwise, we're just going to keep reproducing more young people who turn into old races with power. Because they see the old races with power and think that's where it comes from. No. Any leader has followers. Anybody that you see that is totally biased, totally racist, and they're in a position of power, it's because someone has given them that power. And nine times out of ten, just like an iceberg, what you see at the top is only the beginning. What upholds that structure, that's where the work is. That's that's it. And it's in little moments. It's when a child says, look, mom, that, that woman is brown, and they're admonished, they're told, don't say that. That's the scene. There's something wrong mm-hmm. with her being brown. There's something wrong with her being brown. Rather than saying, yes, and isn't it beautiful? Isn't she beautiful? You can take that same statement that makes you uncomfortable, that seems like you're raising someone who's biased, which you are always, <laughs> and taking it from being something that builds on the structure of other and differs and isn't, and you're taking it to another place where it builds on inclusion and acceptance and isn't that great you, you have that moment all the time and we all know those moments we all have experienced those moments with two and three-year-olds with toddlers who speak their mind without thinking quote unquote <laughs> we all have those moments <laughs> where we can admonish or we can encourage what they're saying and we can learn from how they are telling us what we're teaching because we are always learning and we're always teaching. It doesn't have to be books and academic subjects. We're always teaching what our culture means all the time. Young, old, everybody. We're always teaching what's important to us, what's not important to us, what we deem gracious and wonderful, what we deem uh, outlandish and awful. We're always teaching and we're always in constant. Yeah, that's such great points, Erica. And I mean, so many things swirled at the same time, you know, back to our conversation um, uh, uh, about the problems with with colorblind. Right. And you're and and even with everything so often looking to our children before they have become so enculturated. Right. They are such wonderful guides and and to be able to um, embrace and encourage um those observations and stuff, as you said, uh, rather than reacting from that place of fear again, right? Right. And also and then, when, when our uh, children aren't arbitrators of what's good. And why is that? So mm-hmm. if you have a child that says something that racist, um, start to deconstruct where those racist feelings, thoughts come from. 
because mm-hmm. yes, children children are arbitrators of what we deem uh, necessary right in our society. So if a child comes up with something that's decidedly not right, okay, how did he come to that conclusion? How did she how did she find that opinion in our house in our lives? Where where does that come from? And it could be something as innocuous as a, as a book or a video game or like that that favorite aunt she only sees twice a year. If those ideals being fostered are being unchallenged, that's where the work is. It, it's, it's not assuming anything. It's not assuming that because they're young, they're unbiased. It's not assuming because they're old, they're racist. It's not assuming at all. It's always yeah. constantly asking, where can we be better? Where can we challenge what is wrong where can we make the comfortable uncomfortable where where does that live and it it can't always be things. it can't always be those big statements when, when someone says something so hated that you have to speak it has to be the small moment of of just the slightest fire that you have to speak because then they start to recognize, oh, it's not just big. It starts very small. It starts very small. And then it grows. It starts very small. It starts with a three-year-old that says, why is that woman brown? And rather than admonish them, we don't say that. Say, because her parents were. Mm-hmm. Answering simply, with no inflection, with no thought, with nothing big, just answering the question does more for harmony and comfort than I could possibly tell. One of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, anti-racist stories is I was in a supermarket and uh, a mother and a very young child, couldn't have been more than three, um, was in the store. And this little three-year-old had his eyes on me like a razor. And the mom recognized it right away. She recognized right away. And so she pulled him away and they went on their shopping journey and I could see them aisle to aisle. And finally I'm in line, I'm stationary and she is down an aisle, like at the end of the aisle. And he sees me and he lets go of the cart and he runs for me. I mean, just runs, pull up, pull out, runs for me. Comes up, she's trying to get to him. She can't. Comes up and licks my arm. He licks my arm. And I, I look at him, and I'm so grateful that I love little people. I just do. Because I said to him, it's not chocolate. Is it? So disappointing. It's not chocolate. And he goes, it isn't. It's not chocolate. And I said, yeah, it isn't. I'm brown because my parents are brown. And his mother had to stop in her tracks because she couldn't. She couldn't have grabbed him. She couldn't touch him. I was just, a, and I looked at her and I said, he's such a wonderful boy. You do such a good job with him because he was curious and he satisfied his curiosity. You must encourage him. So I turned a moment that could have been his defining moment, his defining moment in his little life, his defining moment could have been really ugly. And I turned it into something really positive, not only for him, but for his mother, because I wanted her to know it's not bad being curious. It's when that curiosity leads you to believe something that isn't true. It's not the curiosity itself. It's when it leads you to believe something that's not true. So always correct the untrue. He wanted to know why. He had a thought in his mind, and he was going to satisfy that. I could have gone any number of ways with it. I'm so happy I went the way I did because that exchange left everybody smiling instead of someone being horrified, someone being honest, and someone feeling bad. I, I just we we all have those opportunities where we can turn our lemons into lemonade, and that was one of mine. Yeah, that is an awesome story, Erica. <laughs> And a, a great way to um, just just a great example, you know, of how 
uh, we can approach those kind of conversations. Uh, I like like the way you described it uh, as just sharing truth, right? Just what? just just answer the questions truthfully, right? And not be afraid of and not be afraid of being heard answering the question. Because I think yeah, what it is a lot of it is uh, I want to have the right answer, and there is no right answer because that yeah. should an answer might might make further questions, and we want to end that question because that question is uncomfortable. So um, say why is she brown? Well, her parents are brown. Well, why are her parents brown? Leads to a bigger story and a bigger question. And after that answer, um, why do you ask? And and then you get the question, you get the answer that you need to keep going. We we're so used to having final answers, being able to answer concretely. Oh, you have this question. Here's the answer. Well, some of the answers, some of the questions don't have answers. They just lead to more questions. And we can't be afraid of the more, the more mm-hmm. questions, because those questions challenge us in ways that make us, here we go again, uncomfortable. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> we, we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. And unfortunately, North Americans are really not good at being uncomfortable. They like quick solutions. They like rapid response. They don't like to be reflective. They don't like to sit and say, hmm, things that make you go, hmm. They like, they like feeling good. Most people do, but they want it to be quick. They don't look at the long term, uh, and we're not encouraged either socially or politically or even um, morally. We're not, we're not asked to look at the long term, and we need to look at the long term of our answers. If the answer is quick and satisfying, but in the end leaves the person ignorant and worse off. I, I'm all for uh, extended questions and extended answers. I'm all for saying to a child who asks the question that makes you uncomfortable, you know, I don't really know. Let's go to the library and find out. Because then you're telling them, I don't know everything and things that make me uncomfortable, I want to I wanna figure out because I want to have the best answer that I can give you. And sometimes that means at the moment you, you don't have an answer. Let's go find out. Let's let's find out why this is true. Let's find find out why why that is. Um, always inquiring, always learning. It always comes back to we're always learning. There there are no definitive answers to some of these questions. We're always learning. Always learning. Yep. I love that. And that's a great place for us to uh, wrap it up here. Uh, we, it's been a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me, Erica. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate you asking me. This is, this is my first podcast. <laughs> I had, <laughs> I had no idea what to expect. Um, and I appreciate you, um, guiding me along and, and, and encouraging me to do this. Because I don't think I would have otherwise. See, always learning. Yes. So, <laughs> so I appreciate oh, that's, Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? Well, I'm on Facebook, Erica Davis Petrie. That's pretty much where I am. And I'm the moderator of uh, the unschooling group. Uh, the one that has, wow. There's one that has 10,000 members. That's not me. I think it's, I think we're at, at 4,500 members. Um, it, it flares up. It's quiet. It's dispersed. It's not, not as um, popular as the one that has 10,000 members. But um, <laughs> yeah, be a great conversation, and um, you're certainly welcome to come there. The queue to join is enormous because it's, it takes so much time to vet and go through everyone. Um, but if they want to contact me via Facebook, they can send me a personal, like, private message. I heard the podcast, and I'd love to join and school. And then that way I can I can move you out of the queue a little quicker. And um, I always welcome conversation on my page. Always. There's That's a wonderful. To learn there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Erica. Have a great day. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate this. 
Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the third book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Life Through the Lens of Unschooling. This book is a wide array of essays drawn from my blog that shed light on the day-to-day lives of unschooling families. You'll find essays tackling everything from learning to read to visiting relatives, all organized around nine keywords that have been woven into the fabric of our unschooling lives. De-schooling, learning, days, parenting, relationships, family, lifestyle, unconventional, and perspective. The theme is life, the lens, unschooling. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.